ask me a question. Yeah. Trigger me. Trigger you. Yeah, you you have quite uh, deep insights about how this uh, the structure. I've been tracking it since nineteen ninety. I've this been tracking it. This was a response to the question, ultimately, of all of these cover-ups with the WHO. Yes. Points to somebody pulling the strings behind right. the scenes. So you say they did this and they did that. They put this person here. They put that person there. The question is, who is they? Then you said, well, you know, we have to go right back to 1949 to the Russians and to the development of nuclear bombs and nuclear energy and the development of the Atomic Energy Commission out of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission and that Rosalie Bertel was talking about that. So maybe you could go on from there. Well, right. beyond that, well, first of all, with the Russians, with the Soviet Union, using this sort of handiwork to, to create electricity in a country that was starved for, for money and needed electrical power for reconstruction. You have the United States mocking them. And then f finally, some, well, Eisenhower's speech was in 1954. So sometime in the early 1950s, somebody realized that if the United States could harness this nuclear power to generate electricity, they could sell it to the public as peaceful and at the same time have reactors that would, gen that would create the plutonium and the, weapon, the weapons-grade material. It was as simple as that. But the, it started with the atomic, the atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, which developed into the Atomic Energy Commission and later on became the Department of Energy. And as Rosalie Bertel constantly insisted, and it's, it's true, of course, it's obvious, but most people don't know it, the, atomic en the, sorry, the Department of Energy is not a typical department within the cabinet structure similar to, for example, the, Depart the Department of the Interior, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the Sur Surgeon General's Office, it is part and parcel of the military. They run, they manage the whole nuclear arsenal, and they manage all the major new, uh, military laboratories, which are the biggest military laboratories in the world. Perhaps China, now China has something as big that can compete with it, but it's not likely, because Los Alamos, for example, Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge Lawrence Livermore are colossal installations. Where, is, and this where is all, are they? Los Alamos is in New Mexico. Lawrence Livermore is works part hand-in-glove hand in with the University of California, which is one of the big scandals there. And then Oak Ridge is, Oak Ridge is, in, Oak Ridge is in Tennessee. Those are three of the big ones, but there have been others. There was Hanford in the state of Washington, which has been shrunk down to almost nothing. I don't know if it's even still there now, because there are major problems of contamination there. Rosalie Bertel worked on that also, and uh, also Alice Stewart worked on that, and uh, she was another one. She was brilliant, and she was at Cambridge, and they hounded her out of there because because she spoke truth to power. But anyway, you have this institution within the United States that is regarded as benign, and civilian and therefore relatively neutral subject to the power play in politics but it is not at all associated with the with the military in the minds of most of the american public yet it is a, an arm of the military a major arm of the military with its own intelligence service a major intelligence service and they are the one man managing all this now at one point there was a conference at the un dealing with explosive remnants of war and there's an international convention that covers this. And they were, this was a side event during the lunch break when they were, they had brought in experts, including a lot of people from the International Red Cross, which has dealt with this in the humanitarian law, who's supposed to be responsible for these and cleaning them up and whatever. I brought up the question of the use of depleted uranium and uranium munitions and the pollution that they cause and the impossibility of cleaning up after that. And then, of course, the refusal of the United States, which is the, at the time was the only country known to have used this, to even admit that there was anything wrong. Afterwards, the military attaché from the United States diplomatic mission came to me and told me to be quiet. And I asked him what he disagreed with, and he said, what you're saying is wrong. I asked him what he thought was wrong. And he said, it's all wrong. And I said, I'm quoting public sources. And I said, and I can give you the sources. I said, I pieced it together, but it's all in the public domain. And uh, he said, it's all wrong. It's not true. And I said, well, I certainly hope so, because it's very disquieting. 
And he says, it's all wrong. He said, we live in an open and free society. <laughs> and you'll see, all this is going to come out and you'll be proven wrong. And I said, I sincerely hope so, because it is very upsetting to think that this could happen. And he said, well, you'll see. But he said, in the meantime, you just better be quiet. So... You are a brave man, Robert. I'm not a brave man. I'm just uh, just somebody with a big mouth who can't keep it shut. But the point <laughs> is, the the point is, there you hear it from the military attaché. He was there. I was surprised that he was even there because that's not the sort of thing these people usually Which watch. Which year was that? Oh, it was several years ago. It was before the invasion of Iraq, even. Mm. Uh, but uh, because we were still working on the use of depleted uranium munitions. Mm. But the point is that. There was somebody there monitoring this. Now, I've encountered that otherwise at conferences at the UN, people from the United States Diplomatic Mission with no status there or whatever apparent, and they just happen to be there. They come in and they're attending these sessions, and they're obviously monitoring what is being said, what, what areas are being covered, and whatever. That is to be expected because they have their own interests and they want to keep track of things. And But at the same time, one wonders what's going through the, their minds when they hear these things. Do they perceive these people as sub subversive because there are things in there that could be critical of United States foreign policy, which these days, of course, is United States military policy. <laughs> when, I, when I was in Kiev, um, Nakajima said that the reason that WHO couldn't do anything, that when he was director of WHO, he couldn't do anything about radiation, and Chernobyl this was, was because of the IAEA. He said that they were subservient to the atom in all things. And that was actually... That, that, that he they were subservient to the he, Security Council. He stated that he was subservient to the atom. To he the said, atom. He said in this area, health is subservient to the atom. Yeah. That, that was, that was, that right. was his But sentence. he also said at one point that the WH, that the IAEA, he insisted that this was after he had left office, the IAEA answered to the Security Council and all the other agencies answer to the Economic Social Council, which is under the General Assembly. Rosalie Bertel used to insist on that, and I often wondered how that worked in practice, and why in the UN the General Assembly could not assert itself through the Economic and Social Council, the ECOSOC, and push the WHO, especially since the General Assembly represents and all the member states, and he has a substantial majority of people that would support them, and majority yeah. of member states that yeah. would support this, and why they couldn't contradict the anything that the Security Council did. I don't see why no, I, I, don't, I, don't. I don't see the weight yeah. of it there. Rosalie kept insisting on it, and I didn't see that, because the Security Council answers in question, uh, deals with questions of national, international security, yeah. and of course the, the, the famous resolution required to use force for, what, for whatever reason. But in, a, in an area like this, I never understood how exactly, in practice, the Security Council would have power secure, superior to that of the General Assembly. And there's also the question of mobilizing the General Assembly and getting it to act, because to have power on paper is one thing, according to the UN Charter, to be able to issue a resolution and push it and, and whatever, even push it to its limits. But uh, to actually do such a thing in an area that's considered highly sensitive is something else. And I, but I, I never understood that. And but she insisted on that. That that goes way back. That was in the nineteen nineties when Nakajima was still there before he had even spoken about the, uh, mm -hmm. the the Security Council. And for her, that was that was a major reason. But still, it brings you back to the uh, to the idea that really it's very much just James Bond, you know that somebody is put in there that's a puppet, and if he decides to step out of line, they say, well, you step one more move and you'll be sacked or we shoot you. Well, look, for example, look at what happened to Doc Hammarskjöld. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he Or went, Olaf Palme. Who? Olaf Palme. That's, yes, that's his but name Hammarskjöld thing. went down to the Congo with a peace plan, yeah. and the Katang it was inspired by post-war Italy, which had three autonomous has three autonomous regions: Sicily, Sardinia, and the Val d'Aosta, the south, mm. south slope of the Alps, which 
are largely independent of the Italian federal government, although they come under the federal government, for example, for uh, they use the same currency at the time. It was the Italian lira for foreign policy, the post, and whatever. But they collect their own taxes, and they have their own parliaments, which mm -hmm. determine the use of the land, and ultimately, if there's mineral rights and whatever, they have all that there. And this is how Katanga was supposed to find its place within the newly independent mm -hmm. Congo. Mm -hmm. But a, a local parliament representing the Katangis would have, or the Katangans, I think, they called them, would have refused any major concession to a foreign multinational corporation. And it was, the, both the, it was the French, the Belgians, and the U.S. that wanted the concessions, which give them essentially the right to do whatever they want and take everything out and pay no taxes and whatever. And this, this was totally unacceptable. And we find out much later on that when the plane was shot down, we, they knew that then, it didn't crash, but he survived. They found him, I don't know how many hundred yards away from that, with bullets in his head. And we found out that the photographs, the official photographs of the corpse, had been touched up to hide the bullet holes in the head. Yeah, so ultimately that is what happened. And then, and then you have uh, Li jong who who was uh, eliminated by... the. And you know, that was Did very suspicious. Did anybody say anything about that? No, the, no, but the thing that struck me was, first of all, there's going to be no autopsy. And second... They forbid an autopsy. But so, what did they say? They said, "Oh, he just died of a heart attack." He died of a heart, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But I mean, there are no autopsy. You know, he was supposedly in the prime of life, and yeah. and also, given his position, he was a doctor and everything. You would expect him to be in good health. Yeah, yeah. And he, I mean, certainly, he could afford the doctors and the, the health yeah. he needed. Mm -hmm. So why suddenly this problem? It, it would seem to me the first thing you think is to have an autopsy, see what what exactly went wrong, because it's so unexpected. Absolutely. There's no autopsy, no, yeah. and he's just. Ch -ch -ch moved out, and then suddenly Margaret comes onto the center stage. And, yeah. and Margaret, again, had been repudiated by the Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong Commission mm. at, uh, at the end of 2003 because of her management of the SARS epidemic. And so, theoretically, her career in public health at any high level was finished, and she'd be good for back office work or something maybe being trotted out later on as an ambassador, of goodwill ambassador for UNICEF, if, if UNICEF would take her on, which I doubt, but something like that. And then suddenly she, she's got a prominent position at WHO, and she's being told, spoken of already as a, a, a potential uh, successor to John Wook Lee, and then all of a sudden John Wook Lee is gone, and there she is. What happened... So, yeah. well, so you see, my approach to this whole business would be to not even try. All that effort and energy that's gone into this alternative WHO could well have gone into to actually setting up a real alternative WHO. We see with the people's health movement. You have the people's health movement that's real moving. documents and you know real reports and was all that. Was it was it, you need you need lots of money because. You need some money. But you need not quite that a money. bit of money because if you want to get good people, but you do have the heat people's health movement. You have a lot of first-rate doctors and public health mm -hmm. people working part-time for that and giving their time and their effort. We don't hear much of them here because they're concentrated in South Central Asia and to some extent in Africa now. And but where they are, they're doing very good work and they represent the Amaata Declaration. But uh, which is what WHO is supposed to be all about now: public health, the, the best of health for everybody, the highest level of health achievable for each person. And uh, that was something that was repudiated by Brundtland, although Chan has latched on to it again and going, at least Chan has gone back to the idea of basic health care. But the idea behind the basic health care is prevention. And see, when uh, 1995, I think it was, when Taiwan set up its universal health care system, it was based on prevention. Every hamlet you have a dispensary, every village you have a clinic, every town you have a hospital, and the big cities you have major medical centers. And if there's anything wrong, there's always somebody there to consult, even if it's only a nurse practitioner in the dispensary. You've got something, and if the person looks at it and says, I don't know what it is, you've got another a higher level to which you can be referred. And, but it's, the emphasis on, is on prevention. And this is part of how they paid for it originally, because they said we have to have people pay, because people in Hong Kong won't take it seriously if they don't have to pay. But the premiums were just ridiculously low, $2 a month or so, two Hong Kong dollars a month, I don't know, $5 a month, but it was ridiculously low. But the, a lot of it was paid for by diminishing amounts of health care administered yeah. because of prevention. Yeah, but then that loses all the money to the big pharmaceutical people. Yes, it does. Now they're reaching, the, now they're at a turning point, a major turning point, because... 
the prevention is resulting in longevity. And as people get over, older, inevitably they may need more attention. Um, that they're more fragile, and they're, even if they're in good health, they still need more checkups. A person who's 80 years old is better off being seen at least once a year for a checkup than, than, say, a person who's 35 or 40. So there's more demand on the system. And then the other thing is, as the country has grown rich, and it's a wealthy country now, like Australia or Canada, the major medical centers have become world class. So when you get referred to one of these centers for treatment, it's not just basic treatment you're getting. You get everything you would get in New York at Mount Sinai Hospital or New England uh, Baptist Hospital in Boston or whatever. It's it's whatever. And this is, of course, much more expensive. So Which they, brings they're... us to the question of investment, as you said. You, the only argument, the only <clears throat> is for not having independent World Health Organization was that they, they have no money, yeah? For WHO. Yeah. For, for an independent W. For, yeah, if the question is money, yes. So the question is, who, who, who runs the money system? Well, see, there's, there's a major problem, because the WHO budget long ago stopped covering all its expenses, but for certain things they ran fundraisers among member states to raise money for special projects. And as I remember it, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the small cutpox eradication program did not come out of the general budget, but it was special funds contributed for a very special program, which in the end was remarkably successful. But if that was the first and the biggest, which may very well have been the case, then WHO became a victim of its own success, and or the, the, the idea became a a victim of its own success because WHO kept recurring to outside sources for funding for specific projects. But that means that most of this money comes in with strings attached, whereas the general budget is X million every year that WHO can spend as it sees fit. We're going to put this much into this department, that much into that department. Who, who funds that? Well, that's the member states' assessments, which are based, they're similar to the United Nations member state assessments. They're based on gross domestic product and a certain, and so on. But the point is, when you have special funds coming in for the WHO for special pro projects, first of all, if you want to get a, a, a project funded, you've got to get member states that will be interested in it. Now, if it's a question of pure public health, the chance of getting at least some member states is good, are good. But... If you go into what is seen as a specialized area, then it's a little bit harder. This is where Brundtland went off the deep end by pulling in, pulling in money from the private sector, because the private sector won't get in, can't justify getting involved, unless this money is going to bring in an increase in dividends, because it's it's perceived as an investment. So they invested in this, and what did they get back? They get an increase in investment in, in dividends. Why? Because they get an increase in market share or new markets outright. You see, so what you have then is a program in the so-called win-win situation where WHO has its public health program funded, but at the same time, a pharmaceutical company or a medical equipment company is getting a new market. In reality, what happens is the program is tailored specifically to create or to expand the market, and WHO and public health takes, takes second place. You see, now they've reached the point where the general budget covers only 18% of their expenses. So you have 82% coming in from the outside, most of which has strings attached. Like the universities, in fact. Exactly like the universities. And this is why no independent research. That's why you have so little independent public health research. And there are all sorts of things that won't get touched. Now, I remember at a one point they undertook a major study, study on electromagnetic radiation and the causes. And somewhere in the piles of junk that I have, I have the press release we received. And there was a list of probable sources of electromagnetic ra ra radiation that affected people in their daily lives. And on there was computer screens. Shortly thereafter, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made their first donation to WHO. I think it was $5 million for the polio eradication program. We received a new press release, and there was a new list probable source of electromagnetic radiations and computer screens have been removed. Right, yeah. Okay. I'm the fellow who was there today, uh, I think I have his name here. No, I don't. He's the, 
He has worked on electromagnetic radi- radiation. I know. I have his name. Yeah. He's he's in the committee. We yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got his name. I've got, I've got his. It's on his paperwork. But he's worked on electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. And he will tell you the dangers of now. Brundtland ran into big trouble because one time when she was in Norway on a home visit, she was asked why she never used a, a cell phone, and she said because the way they give me headaches. And there was an outcry from the industry over that, and she had to retract that. And, however, in the state of Geneva, the canton of Geneva, it is forbidden to put the antennas for cell phones on the roofs of residential buildings because they're considered a health hazard. Mm. So there's obviously something there, and this goes back. This goes back 15 years in Geneva, so I mean, maybe you know at least. So. You have electromagnetic radiation as a serious source of s- danger to health generally. And a major source of this is considered the computer screens, which this fellow insisted on. What happened to the, in- the investigation in the end? It disappeared. It never came to fruition. Mm. Yeah. When we did the, per- the, the pinch, um, we got a lot of money in, in the Netherlands. I was... Uh, Employed by these people called the Policy Information Network for Child Health, is EU funding, Commission funding, and we were we had to look at all the exposures to children, but we weren't allowed to look at mobile phones or electromagnetic. It was absolutely specific. But if we go back to the investment question, so uh, it's only something like less than twenty percent. The last figures I saw were. For the pre, I think for the current budget that's running, it was eighteen percent of the general contributions that uh, got counted for the overall what is spend. The budget? I don't know to tell you the truth. It's 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 substantial. Well, uh, hundred million? Oh no, it's it hundreds. It is on of the web page. It's hundreds of million. Hundreds it's of it's, million. it's a substantial budget. But the budgets are usually voted for two years, as I remember it. Right. But anyway, the 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 the, the thing is that this money comes in with strings attached and. Yeah. Little by little, the industry has worked its way in. You hear the, the big blow to the UN system overall, and then by extension to the WHO, was Kofi Annan's creation of the, the Global Compact. Because the Global Compact was an effort on the surface to get industries to abide by UN human rights standards, including the major labor conventions of the ILO. Mm-hmm. Kofi Annan announced it at Davos, at the World Economic Forum. It At the time, I think it was nine major documents that were to be the reference points that these companies agreed to sign on to. There was no mechanism for monitoring at all, yet any company signing on to it was allowed to use the United Nations logo in its advertising. And there was an outcry, yet that went through. Nestle's, Nestle is a member, and I think Rio Tinto Zinc is a member. I mean, some of the worst companies in the world are members of the Global Compact. And Kofi Annan was saying, oh, but we've got to get them all on board, and we've got to keep the dialogue going. And it's, it's, what, it's a dialogue of the deaf, because you can say what you want to them, they don't hear it. And, and whatever, and Nestle, for example, you know, with the millions of babies and newborns being killed in the, in the poor countries, and even some of the rich countries now, by the use of the, and abuse of the infant formula. And, and, and whatever, that's an excellent example. But the, 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 the global compact opened the doors to the corporations within the UN, and then they were welcome at UN meetings, they could sub- start submitting documents, position papers, and whatever. And so, of course, the, the WHO is under the UN, the WHO comes under a, um, Ban Ki-moon, that he's the overseer or the boss, if you will, of Margaret Chan. And so what is good for the UN system, of course, extends to the WHO. But I mean, that they were already put, but bro, bro, Gro Harlem Brundtland was already pushing in that direction anyway. And, uh, with the, you know, as I said, her first trip abroad was to Atlanta. And Atlanta has the Center for de- de- uh, Disease DC. Controls yeah. and Prevention. And when I heard she was going to Atlanta, that's what I assumed. And and then it was a member of the WHO Staff Association who said, oh no, she's going to speak to the 
chief executive officer of Coca-Cola. And you know, Coca-Cola under the Reagan administration, when the Reagan administration t shook everything up and they were cutting the subsidies for the Department of Agricultural uh, Cultures that subsidized the school lunches for the poor children, they, one of the things they said, that the, the, this, the, the act that authorized this by voted by Congress said that the meals had to be balanced and so there had to be at least a vegetable. And to cut the funds, they were saying they could, if they served relish with the meal, the relish would count as a vegetable. <laughs> but even under that, Coca-Cola soft drinks were not allowed in the schools because they were completely non-nutritive. And I worked, I was teaching in Bristol, Connecticut at the time in a high school, and they had soft drink machines, and they were in a small separate room apart which was locked until 15 minutes after the end of the school day because they got federal subsidies for a certain number of poor children in the community towards their, their free lunches. And it was only 15 minutes after the end of the school day that you could, one could go in there and buy soft drinks from these machines, including Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola. Mm, mm. And But that was for the students who stayed after school for extracurricular activities. But during the ordinary school day, there was no access to these. It was strictly forbidden. Of course. Because Coca-Cola was strictly not, it was a non-food. And yet, Brooklyn now is working for Pepsi-Cola. So was Derek Yak, uh, Yak, who was the, the head of the tobacco. Which year are we talking this? She's there now. Mm. But when I, when I was teaching schools in the 1980s in Bristol, mm. but then again, it was under the Reagan administration. But mm. even under the Reagan administration, they couldn't allow Coca-Cola in the schools. So what is your overall sort of insight? How this monster could be deconstructed? This sort of... Uh, if we talk just sort the of... The only thing they can reconstruct it is that if people want to take back their governments and uh, assert their own control... The problem is that when you have local control of government, it's very difficult, and the Swiss have experienced this, extremely difficult to run a military-industrial complex. And you see the whittling down of the Swiss military over the years, especially since the fall. The, the, see, the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union was there, the military was held up as a necessity to defend the neutrality. And if they're neutral, you know, why, why did they have to fear the Soviet Union or whatever? But anyway, they, that was the argument. But once the Soviet Union collapsed, they had no more goblin out there to fear. And then there was a tremendous shift, slow but steady, starting with the extreme left and moving into the left and even to the right, to cut back and cut back and cut back on the military. But in Switzerland, remember, there's the you have a federal system that is very powerful. It's the cantons, the states, that levy the income taxes and tax. And they're the ones that run their own universities. They, they have tremendous power. The federal government is still runs foreign affairs and certain things, and the military, of course. But their role is primarily what it should be in a proper federal system, coordinating the efforts of the states, you see? And so what you have is local movements pushing. And the initial colossal and, and, and for the Swiss earth-shaking popular initiative to abolish the army came from the local the local grassroots organizations. And at the time it was Kaspar Wiedegar who was the head of the, the, uh, the, 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 the military. And he, he simply, uh, he denounced them as unpatriotic, of course, but he, he also denounced them as radical fringe and s stupid, ignorant, naive, whatever. And he said, of course, you're going to have radical fringe who will go out and vote for this. He said, first of all, it's of no interest to the public. Nobody takes this seriously. You're not going to hit, you're going to have a minor turnout because people can't, can't be bothered going out to vote for such a, on such a thing. And you'll get maybe 2% of the vote, and it'll be the radical fringe, and you'll see, and that's it, and it'll go down, and it'll be all over. Well, anyway, in the end, they had a record turnout. It was a colossal turnout, and they got something like 38% of the vote in favor of abolishing the army. army. And Villiger was on television that Sunday evening when the final votes were coming in. And he was literally stuttering. He couldn't believe it. But it was all grassroots organizations. So when you have local power, you have some possibility, at least, of fighting the system. Now, if you go back to the United States, which is the big colossal power and the, the biggest example of centralized power in the world today, the United States had a federalist system created by the the, Const the Federal Constitution of 1788. And 
the, the Constitution created only a, a state system, a government. And because you had 13 independent states still arguing with each other, very jealous of their independence, you have an effort to create a central government to coordinate things because the Continental Congress that they had convened when they needed something that coordinated the, uh, the Confederation, which was the alliance, was not sufficient. They needed a single currency, they needed to regulate foreign trade and whatever. So they created a system and it was voted in on the stipulation that they had a Bill of Rights because it, it, there was nothing about the, the citizens there. It was simply the structure of the government. However, the Tenth Amendment that was adopted of the ten that were adopted all together right after the ratification of the Constitution contains what is called the Supremacy Clause. And it says the states are supreme. Any power not given specifically to the federal government remains with the states. And the whole battle leading up to the War of Southern Secession, which broke out in 1861, was over in part states' rights. Because the major industrial industrial interests that were coming to the fore at the time wanted a strong central government to create a single unified domestic market. And the southerners and the northerners that controlled the state legislatures and all this saw this in their interest because they were geared to finance, trade, and banking, and whatever. Southerners wanted states' rights. It was a very good example of the right thing for the wrong reason because they were king of the hill at home. They ran the states, the, the great planters, and whatever. But the thing was they had power at home. And if, with time opening up the system, the power would have remained in the states and other people could have participated in that, including, including the people they called the poor whites and ultimately the blacks. But the thing was, once the, le the South seceded, Lincoln's administration, people don't talk about this, pushed through Congress all the legislation that destroyed the state's rights, destroyed the federal system as a federal system, concentrated power in Washington. Yeah. And then you get the system you have today. It started then in the 1860s, right. and it was already very strong. It was built then. The power is in Washington, and the states have no more real power. When did 1860s. it get destroyed? 1860s. 1860s. Yeah. And by the time the states, the southern states, were brought back into the Union, and their representatives, it was the whole system had been transformed. Okay. It was no longer a system as described by the, the Constitution. Instead, you have what they call today the unitary executive. Power is vested in the executive, not a single person to pull the strings and run the operation. Whereas the Constitution, if you want to divide it, try to do it numerically, would say 60% of the power should be with the Congress, maybe more, and then something with the executive and something with the judicial. And what you have now is 98%, 99% of it is in the executive. But this was the move Lincoln. Lincoln was, to me, Lincoln was the great proto-fascist. He wanted everything at the top. Lincoln, like the fascists, claimed to speak for everybody. And Lincoln said, there's no dissent allowed in England. People forget this. If they ever knew it, Lincoln suspended the Constitution when the war broke out. Lincoln said, I am the boss. And the southern states, which legally succeeded through a democratic a vote mm. of the Democratic State Assembly, Lincoln said, no, you are in rebellion against me. Yeah. And the southern, the southerners, therefore, were labeled... The, 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 the nickname they gave him was Johnny Rebel, Johnny Reb, and you still hear that, that Johnny Reb, if you know somebody from the South is called a Johnny Reb. And that's where it comes, they were, rebel, they were in rebellion against what? Legally, they seceded from the Union. And then Lincoln made a call up for troops, and nobody came. So, so what did he do? So he, launched a law, he launched a war to abolish slavery, but slavery was legal according to the Constitution. And so what did they do? They bring before, the abolitionists bring before the Congress an amendment to amend the Constitution to abolish slavery, and Lincoln sabotages it. Because no, 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 then you're going to, then you're going to upset the people in the states that haven't seceded yet. We can't abolish slavery, but we can go to war and slaughter 650,000 people and destroy the whole South in order to slave the slaves. Of course, it was, it was, that was not it at all. The reason for the war was to keep the, co the cotton in the Union because that was the main, mainstay of textile industry, which was the mainstay of industry. But I mean, it, it was a, very much a fascist system already. And that's what you get when you get power concentrated at the top and a few people or one puppet yeah. pulling the strings. Yeah. So the problem is to then reverse that Put the power mm. back. In. Now, in the United States, theoretically, on paper, even within today, there's a great deal of power at the local level. The communities, the counties, and then the states. In reality, it doesn't work that way. Part of it is that the states have so little power to tax and they have so little money to do anything. But part of it is that the public has been brainwashed. 
And this is the problem you see in Western Europe also, and even in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And people are raised not to be citizens, not to take an interest in public affairs, but to be consumers. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so they, and so how do you take on this, the monster, the beast? Because when people see their interests as being, making sure this, the, the stores are well stocked and they have a credit card they can use if they run out of cash to keep buying. And, and this is what they're convinced is the big thing. So decentralization is the... Decentralization is a very important mm. thing. Shifting the power downward, but again, then it becomes extremely difficult to run a military industrial complex. And the Swiss, again, they're an excellent example of that. They whittled down the army. The next proposal is to whittle it down now to 80,000 men. Used to be the biggest standing army in the world relative to the population. Everybody had to serve in the army. Where? Here yeah. in Switzerland. Yeah? It was colossal. Yeah, everybody had to serve. And you went, went in when you were Women 18. too? No, but you had to go in when you were 18, you did your basic service, and you went back every two years until you were 54. What? To defend the neutrality. I mean, they, you know, they have, they, they have these fighter-bomber jets, they have all this stuff. It's incredible what they have. They have huge, huge arsenals dug into the mountains. They every have, two years, how long? Until you were 54, starting when you were 18. No, but how, yeah. how, after two years, how long were you in the, then before you had another two years? No, you went in every two years. You went in for basic training, which was six months, I think, or, or yeah. nine months, and then you went in every two years for another month or two. Oh, I see. Oh. Okay, yeah. Like you see? Territorial. Okay. So, and, and whatever, but it was a huge amount of time, and you were supposed to collect your salary then. And now there's another thing pushing against. The businesses don't want to pay salaries for people who are absent all this time. And so now they have a crisis because the upper-level management, who were from the the old line families, the, the grand bourgeoisie, as they call it in French, these people now would have been the candidates for the officer corps, and they're not interested anymore. Mm. Yeah. And so the, the, the died in the world conservatives and the extreme right wingers are all crying because they can't get candidates for officer schools now. But these people don't want to be bothered, and the employers don't want to pay them their salaries if they're good, because when you're an officer, you go for even longer. And so you're going to be, all of a sudden there's going to be a hole in the management because the guy isn't going to be there for, for, for six months. And now is the crucial question. The how does the Swiss banking system, the black hole in the money system, play in? The banking system is something else. The banking system draws in the money for two reasons. First of all, the bank's secrecy. And second, just because of the quality of the management. And they're known for being cautious in their investments and, uh, for example, I interviewed, interviewed somebody from the Banque Pictet here, which, is, which goes back, I think, to 1807. It's the biggest private bank in the world. And the portfolio manager said to me, we were talking about hedge funds and whatever, he said, we steer clear of that. It's too risky. We can't, he said, it's the sort of thing that even if you know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. And, so they don't do that. And he, said we, we, and he said, we will invest in that only if you sign a disclaimer exonerating us from the responsibility. And he mentioned a client that they had had who used to come in regularly and who wanted them to invest in this. And so they did because he, he specifically requested it. And he worked with them. And he made a fortune. But he pulled his money out of the hedge funds well ahead of the crash. And he said, it's, it's become too risky. And he saw that. But the bank itself, as a general policy, would not in, invest in the hedge funds because they said it's too risky. And so you're getting maybe only 7, 8, 9% return on your investment as opposed to maybe 35% in a hedge fund. But when the bottom falls out of the market, you're still getting your 9%. Mm. You see? Whereas you uh, people in the United States who had 401k investment uh, retirement plans invested in hedge funds lost everything. You see, and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they think, oh, we're going to retire early at the age of 60, you know, and we'll have a fabulous income, and zip, it's all gone. Whereas the, at a bank like that, the bank, the private banks here in particular, you know it's... Now, the problem for the, the United Bank of Switzerland, the UBS, which the federal government bailed out in the amount of 68 billion francs, was that they were playing the markets in London and New York. They were present in a big way in London and New York, and they were involved in all this, and they got stung badly. But you go to the private banks, and Pinté is a major bank. It's a huge bank. You know, they got, what, $100 billion under, under, under management or something, more than that. And, you know, but they, they, were, they would steer clear of that. They wouldn't touch that sort of stuff because they don't know exactly what's going on, and, you can't, and, they, they, and their analyses won't allow them to understand it because it was not... You couldn't grasp it. The IMF itself didn't. So you think that the Swiss banking is all sound, mostly, yeah? For the most part, it's all sound, although you have foreign banks that have, re you have representations here, 
and you know who knows what they're doing. But generally, the the old line, the Swiss banks themselves, the private banks here in Zurich and Basel and Bern and whatever and whatever, generally they're very sound because they're just so cautious, and and. And that's it. And then the other thing, of course, is the bank secrecy. If you have money you want to hide, a colossal amount of income, and you don't want to pay taxes on it, you bring it here, and they'll help you arrange that to the extent possible. Now, now, they're, now they're under pressure, and it's, it's, it's a lot less easy to do it now. But, uh, but the, the banking secrecy laws are still there in, in effect, and, and depending on where you're from and who's making, putting pressure on you and what on the Swiss banks, you, you, can, you can come to some sort of agreement. So there, there is this attraction. There, this colossal amount of money here. I don't know what it's four and a, four and a half trillion dollars. I think in private money, it's the biggest concentration of private money in the world here, being managed by the banks. But again, part well, of I thought the, it was more than that. No, it's just the private money, and yeah. then there are also pension plan, the funds, and foundation money, and whatever. But the point is that it, there's the quality of the management, which makes Switzerland attractive, even when people can't keep the, the funds secret. Although Singapore now, I think, is giving them a run for their money, but much less, much less so places like the Cayman Islands or Bermuda. And uh, the other thing is the secrecy when it works and to the extent it can still work for certain people. So, but there, there's a lot of money here, and of course the banks take a certain percentage of the money they're managing, and so the more money they manage, the more income they have coming in, and so they do very well, and a lot of it gets circulated in the economy, which is why you see so many people here who spend so munificently. And I have been sort of also having this question about how Vatican is connected to Swiss banking system. The is Vatican? there? Yeah? The, there's the question of the Vatican Bank, which had major problems in the 1980, and it was this, they were mixed up with the Mafia. There, there was Roberto Calvi, who was hanged, uh, found hanged under Blackfriars Bridge in London. It was supposed to be a suicide, and in the end, it wasn't a suicide, but they didn't know what, what it was. It's, it's a very dirty story. But the, uh, the, the Vatican Bank has been accused of using Swiss banks as conduits and whatever because of the banking secrecy. If that's the case, it'd be very difficult, I mean, to prove unless somebody revealed it outright or showed documents because the Swiss banks would treat the Vatican Bank as just another client, client and course. subject to bank or client confidentiality. And for the most part, from what I understand, the bank, the Vatican Bank ran its own affairs. It had its own people, its own advisors, and whatever. The one, they, the big bank they were working through when they needed commercial bank connections with the Banco Ambrosiano in Milan, which went bankrupt and which is which triggered the scandal. Uh -huh. And the, the the Vatican in the end cost, coughed up a colossal amount of money to cover losses there. But I, the, there's been stories of that, but I don't know that they're seriously involved in Swiss banking. I've, I've never heard that. Maybe only on the, if they are, I, I say, on the periphery. But of course one another, well, doesn't know, but I don't see any real reason for it. Unless since the Banco, Banco Ambrosiano scandal, maybe they've decided to entrust their funds for management to a Swiss bank. Mm, mm. But, uh, but Swiss banking, this is some phenomenon uh, in the world. It's a world sort of black hole. It's well, they became famous because of the bank secrecy laws. And the bank secrecy laws were voted in, in the 1930s because it was a socialist government in France that was taxing people. Oh, God, how interesting. And people, people say, oh, they did it to protect the Jewish money. It protected the Jews in the end after Hitler came to power, but it was not voted to protect the Jews. It was voted initially to to uh, to protect French depositors who had funds here and who risked being tracked by the fiscal authorities in France because they had income coming in from their investments that they weren't paying taxes on. Hmm. And um, But Switzerland is very welcoming and accommodating to foreign money, to, to foreign investors. For example, if you have money in the bank here and you're a foreigner, and you die, and you leave it to someone who doesn't leave in Switzerland. There's no inheritance tax on it. Hmm. The money hmm. is here, but it passes to your heirs, to your heirs, untaxed. Wow. Which is an incentive to people who inherit it to leave it right here, and continue letting the bank management manage it. You see, 
but but there, there are lots of accommodations. There are certain categories of investment income, whatever that can be highly adva advantageous to foreigners and and, and whatever. Uh, so obviously it's. It, it's able to attract foreign funds and then but in the past the big thing was the strictness of the bank secrecy laws and how carefully they were enforced because uh you know, it seems that swiss is banking and austria is insurance yeah switzerland is big in insurance but switzerland is also big in reinsurance which is the 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 insurance of colossal things you know like uh whole mining industries or um, wow. um, you know, uh, cruise ships and things like that, like Lloyd's in London. But three of the major areas, there's Germany, there's Switzerland, there's, and there's England for reinsurance. Austria also has good banking secrecy laws, but and Austria has been one of the holdouts in the European Union. But Austria has been more supple, from what I recall, in dealing with the European Union, whereas the Switzerland, is, Switzerland has put up a brick wall. The other country that's very well known for its banking secrecy and whatever for being very accommodating is Luxembourg within the European Union. And then otherwise you have countries that are outside like Monaco, Andorra, San Marino mm, mm. to varying degrees. And then of course the, the Channel Islands. The big offshore tax havens are connected to the Anglo-Saxons. So you have the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Bahamas, and the... the uh, the 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 uh, Channel Islands and then Singapore and uh, Hong Kong, uh -huh. and they're all connected to London and New York. I see. I see. And and Switzerland, of course, is one big tax haven in a sense, but the yes. Swiss have very good laws. Now the problem is enforcing them because the number of people they have in the federal government working on enforcement is woefully inadequate to the the number of cases that are reported to them that they should look into. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the big criticisms of the left here. They say, we've got this legislation, what are you doing about it? Whereas the right is saying, look, at we've got exemplary legislation on the books. And in many cases it's true, but it's not good if you don't enforce it. Yeah. You see, so they're That's... very careful about <laughs> enforcing it. But, uh, but anyway, again, part of the, the big attraction is just the quality of the management. And the other thing, of course, if you will, a, ma a major thing is the, s the stableness, the stableness of the Swiss franc. Mm. Because to the extent the Swiss franc has altered over the years since the Bretton Woods agreements broke up in 1971, it has gone up in value. I mean, in 1971, a, Swiss, a dollar would have bought you four francs 15. Now it'll buy you 90-something centimes, not even a franc. You see, so if you bought Swiss francs, then uh, with your dollars, you'd have four francs fifteen for every dollar, and you'd have an all. If you now, if you still have those Swiss francs in the bank, and finally you decide in your retirement you have to cash them in, you, and you're, you're you're still living in the United States, you're going to get an awful lot of dollars for those Swiss francs. Plus, you get interest accruing. You see. Which brings us to the full circle with Bretton Woods. That was <laughs> Bretton Woods. Yes, yeah, but Bretton, Bre that was the Bretton Woods Agreement, which yeah. fixed the, the exchange rates four German marks to the dollar, four German yeah. marks to the dollar. Mm. Five Swiss, five French francs, six hundred Italian lira, and so on. So, anyway, that's broken up. But you see that the Swiss franc has altered relative to the other currencies in the sense that it's gone up, and that's hard on the Swiss because the major Switzerland must export more than fifty percent of its GDP because the domestic market is not sufficient, and it's a major industrial country still, still producing. And one of the big things they produce are machine tools, and they they, they produce some of the best in the world, but their major market is Europe. And if the Swiss franc goes too high relative to the euro, which is what happened last summer, Swiss franc was worth one euro, the cost of their products is too high. So now they brought it down. The Swiss franc is worth 80 centimes or so. And uh, they, 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 they... So they, you have centimes? I have centimes, cents, yes. So, so and you call them centimes? Centimes, they call them in, 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 in French. In, 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 uh, in German, they're called fennec. Okay. Uh, fennec. No, rappen, they're called. In, in German, they were called fennec in Germany. And in uh, in the Alemannic part of Switzerland, they're called Rappen, R A P P E N. The, 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 but they're one hundredths of the monetary unit, one hundredths of the Very franc. So they're sent there, whatever. And Thank you so much for this interview, and uh, we, we we hope to have you as an expert in our. <laughs> I'm not an expert. I'm knowledgeable in certain areas, but I'm oh, not an expert. Be very... careful whom you apply the term expert to. Yeah, but you, you are it. very knowledgeable, really. 
but uh, you, well, it tends to accumulate. Wonderful. Okay, I should go 